This is a clinical laboratory at Kaiser Permanente Hospital in Redwood City. The lab technicians here are trying to isolate viruses, the kind that can harm your body. Just south of here in the Silicon Valley, software engineers are also trying to isolate viruses, the kind that can harm your computer. Today we'll take a look at computer viruses and the software vaccines that combat them on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by the Software Publishers Association, which reminds you it's a federal offense to copy software. The SBA provides information on how to stay software legal. Funding is also provided by PC Connection and Mac Connection, and by Byte Magazine and Bix. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and with me today is Paul Schindler. Paul, we have a dumb little program up here on the computer just to write the words Computer Chronicles on the screen. The reason I did it, though, is because there is a virus in this machine. And in just a second, there it is. It just started. It's the Cascade virus, which just sort of cascades letters down from the screen to the bottom. A little nuisance virus, not too serious, won't cause any great harm. But of course, some viruses do cause great harm to your computer. What's the worst case scenario? What kind of damage can a virus do? There are some malicious viruses, Stuart, that attack the hard disk. And their means of attack is particularly insidious. They attack what's known as the fat table, the uh -huh. portion of the disk that contains the information about where files are located. And a sufficiently malicious virus will zero out both copies of that fat table and make your disk dead hard drive. Useless, can't boot up from it, can't find your files. Unrecoverable. But the yeah. good news is that it can be recovered if you practice the most fundamental and most important of all good PC practices, and that is regular backup. Yeah, backup, backup. If you have your files backed up, you can always restore them from the most recent backup and defeat any yeah. known virus. Well, Paul, today we'll take a look at several vaccines to protect your computer from a virus invasion. We'll look at SAM, Virex, PC, Certus, and a shareware program for the Macintosh called Disinfectant. Now, why do hackers plant viruses? What kind of guys are these? We visited computer columnist John Dvorak to learn more about the psychological profile of the virus hacker. They're, they're young, they're mostly male, they probably like pizza and Coca-Cola, you can probably find them at a 7-Eleven, and they probably have weird hours, you know, they stay up real late. That may sound like the description of a typical teenager, but beware, because it may also be the picture of a typical computer hacker. According to the Computer Virus Industry Association, some 60,000 PCs across the country are infected by viruses every month. Hackers try to infiltrate the systems for a variety of reasons. For some, it's just a practical joke. Others may have a score to settle with a former boss. The real reason may be a whole lot simpler, but just as harmful. There's two things that make people create viruses. One is some peer group pressure. They are in a group that does this kind of stuff. The other one is boredom, because they, you know, maybe if these people were employed, and actually there are some people who are employed that create viruses, and there's just a cheap thrill of doing it and seeing, seeing what happens to your creation. It is a little bit like graffiti art in that regard you know, throwing something up on the wall and then taking off before the police catch you. You know, it's not your wall. It's, it's just typical, mostly young guys that, that are kind of bored. But the hacker's boredom may have made users more careful. Actually, they, it may help encourage users to make backup files. Most people do not back up their computer. It's a known fact. I mean, you know, the old joke is I back up my computer once a year whether it needs it or not. Um, the fact is you should be backing up more often and maybe viruses will encourage people to do that. I hope so. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Maria Gabriel. We're fortunate to have with us two of the leaders in the battle against computer viruses. This is Peter Tippett, president of Certus International. With us also Ross Greenberg, the developer of Virex PC. Paul? Ross, in the race between the good guys and the bad guys in the virus field, who's winning? The good guys are. And why is that? It's our job to win. What, what, it, can you quantify the risk for a user? I mean, I'm just sitting there with my PC. How, how, how worried should I be about viruses? Do you make backups? Yes. If you make backups, you don't have that much of a risk. Hmm. You can still make mistakes, you can still inconvenience yourself, but you won't damage yourself beyond recovery. Uh -huh. 
to prevent that kind of, uh, even that inconvenience, you should be using some kind of antivirus product. Mm. All right, let's get to them. And, and Certus is the product that uh, you've got, Peter, and show us how Certus approaches the virus problem. Well, like any good antivirus software, Certus can find viruses if they already exist on your system or if a, a file has a virus in it by scanning. And Certus is right now scanning for 250 different computer viruses. Um, but let me, uh, but Certus can do fundamental things against computer viruses as well. It can stop files from running if they're changed in even the slightest bit. So you're going to switch over to a directory that has a file in it that you know has a virus That's in it. right. I've got in this directory a file that has the Jerusalem virus, and Certus, of course, recognizes that it's got the Jerusalem virus in it and won't let it run. Um, that, that any good antivirus product should be able to do. But if I take this out of memory, Take Certus out of memory. If I take the part of Certus out of memory that is stopping uh, known viruses from running, and I run that program anyway, Certus's fundamental virus protection will notice that the program has changed or is not one of the programs that's already known to the system. So even though it didn't scan and find it, it still alerts you that's that right. it's That's right. That this is there. a new system, a, right. new, a new file, or it altered somehow from the old file. Let me say that I want to run it anyway, although on a network or anywhere, you can control who runs what software anywhere on the system. Uh, Certus yeah. asks again that this is a new, a new file and something is wrong with it. I'm going to let it run anyway, and now that when the program runs, the virus is in memory. Now, the Jerusalem virus will infect any program that I run after it's in memory. So let me run a program that shows me what's in memory, uh -huh. and when I try and run that program, Certus prevents this thing from being infected by the virus. Mm -hmm. It prevents the replication of so computer again, viruses. So again, even once the virus has gotten in there, the Certus program's jumping it and hurting stopping. Anything. It'll yeah. stop it from spreading, right. limit the damage. The program ran anyway in an uninfected form, and now we look at the bottom of the screen, we can see that there's a 1.7K program in yeah. memory. That's the Jerusalem virus. If I run a program to, um, to release this... Uh, you got to respell release. Okay. You're going to release the... You're going to remove that virus from memory. I'm going to remove the virus from memory, mm -hmm. and even the program that would remove the virus from memory is being attempted by the virus to be infected. Uh -huh. Certus prevent that from happening. The virus is now gone from the system. Mm. Now, Certus does many other things besides just stopping uh, viruses from running. If I were to do something like formatting the C drive, uh, this is potentially something dangerous, yes. as would erasing your root directory, as right. would uh, 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 yeah. uh, running FDisk and destroying the FAT table or the, right. the partition table or directory structure. And it appears to be doing it. It appears to be doing it, but if I stop that from happening and I get a directory, you'll see that nothing is wrong. Uh -huh. If I did other things that would harm the system, still nothing is wrong. No. Certus works on a network and it works on freestanding PCs and it can control who runs what software, it controls software theft, it can do other kinds of security oh. things as well. But if the system fails completely, Certus has this disk called the critical disk. The critical disk, if booted, will recover from any crashed hard drive, unless literally a bullet yeah. goes through your hard drive. <laughs> if the hard drive is recoverable by a technician after hours of work, the uh, critical disk uh. will recover it just by the user booting from the critical yeah. disk. All right, Ross, let's turn to Virex PC. And, and what does that program add to the game here? How different is it from what we just saw? Well, its primary difference with that, it, uh, it includes disinfectors. Uh -huh. When it finds a virus, it gives you uh, the opportunity to remove that virus from uh, the system and from the particular program, so that by removing it, you now get back the original program in its pristine state. You don't have to even worry about going to those backups that you promised me that you made. <laughs> <laughs> Which I didn't really do, of course. All right, show us how Virex PC works then, Ross. Sure. If you take a look in the upper left hand, I'm sorry, upper right hand corner yeah. of the screen, you'll see that there's a little V that indicates that Virex PC is active. There's okay. an active monitor portion to Virex PC as well as a scanner. What I'm going to do is I'm going to scan the disk for viruses. I know for a fact that there are some viruses here because I put them there. Yeah. Um, basically, what a scanner does, it looks for a known signature pattern mm -hmm. that it, there are about 200 viruses roughly. Everyone has different counts on them. But we include a, a full signature list that you can later on update as you feel like it. And of course, we update it as well. And This appears to be going pretty quickly. Oh, yeah. It's something that we're proud of. We're the fastest scanner out there, as far as we know. Mm -hmm. the next round of competition comes through when someone decides to try to be faster than we are. So basically, if there's a new virus which isn't in your list of recognizable things, I mean, it, it's, well, what's happening here? Well, I just found a, a virus, the South African virus. This is a relatively rare virus. It doesn't spread much. Uh, as such, we don't provide for a disinfector on this one. We allow you to either remove it from memory, uh -huh. that is from the disk's memory, or to ignore it. In this case, I'm going to ignore it. Okay. In fact, there are two versions of that one, so I'll ignore that one as well. But here we've got one that's called the Jerusalem virus. This yeah. is probably the, uh, the most common virus right. out there, um, popular perhaps. Okay, so what can we do with it? 
Okay, well, you can either, again, you can remove it or you can ignore it. In this case, you can disinfect it. I'm going to hit a D and it will disinfect it. But you'll also note that the little pop-up box will change because we're going to be doing something that Virex PC doesn't like. We're going to be writing into a COM file. Yeah. So if a virus were to do this, you'd get the same exact kind of pop-up mm -hmm. that says that there's something going on and it really should not go on. We're just going to allow it to take place. There'll be another virus after this one. We just found it here. And we're going to ignore this one. Just let you it continue. just cleaned up that COM file. It no longer has the Jerusalem virus, virus in it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So what I just did now is I stopped the scan. And you have the option here of taking it out to the printer, a log file, saving it in a data file, or just exiting. We'll just exit from this. And if you look up on the screen, as you can see, uh, one of the infections of the Jerusalem version B virus has now been disinfected. Yeah. That means that at this point right now, you can run that program without having to worry about it being a virus mm -hmm. or being infected. Uh, what we can do is take a look. This directory here has not had any disinfection taking place. Yeah. Let's try running a, a file. Uh, let's try running, as an example, the eaters file. Uh, this is the same one that we just disinfected. Mm -hmm. In this case now, however, I'm just going to try running it. Yeah. And in this case, it automatically disinfected it for you uh, from the screen. Mm -hmm. And now it's going to go run it. Okay. And I'm going to just allow that to go. It tells me that there's been a modified checksum on this one. The reason why it was modified is because it just finished uh, taking the right. infection out of it. Right. So I'm going to allow it to execute anyway. And it's going to tell me that it's already installed. I'm now going to run it, which is this fun little thing here. Uh -huh. right. <laughs> that, of course, is just fun. And one of the yeah. problems that we have with any thing that's uh, related to viruses is sometimes fun things like that are called viruses when they're mm -hmm. not. Yeah. Everyone keeps on blaming everything as being a, a virus. Yeah. And that's one of my jobs is to make sure that when you have a virus, you're protected. And that means you can go back to blaming things like spilled yeah. cups of coffee. Yeah, Ross, in just a few seconds, that question I was going to ask you before. What about the virus that, that isn't known that gets into a system? What, what happens then? Okay, well, first, of course, our job is to make sure that it's known to us yeah. and, to and to protect against it. But also, there are protections against suspicious activity that Virus PC is able to prevent. Yeah. If it sees something like that, as an example, someone trying to format your hard disk, even right, erroneously, right, right you can prevent that from So happening. you can detect the behavior even though you might detect, not detect the particular virus. Exactly so. All right, Peter Ross, we're out of time. Thanks very much. Well, if you have lots of computers on a network, odds are you are vulnerable to a possible virus attack. At Caltrans here in California, they have lots of computers, but a very serious policy for virus prevention. Here's a report. A construction crew on the freeway can mean long delays and missed appointments. But even Caltrans, the California Department of Transportation, is vulnerable to delays, computer delays caused by viruses. This Caltrans district office uses over 400 computers to do everything from simple word processing to forecasting traffic for Northern California. Any virus attack to its system can mean chaos. Depending on the severity of the, uh, of the virus, anything from uh, anything minor to a message popping up on a screen to a whole system uh, crashing, um, be it a, uh, a network, uh, one network uh, getting virus, getting virus, and then affecting the other networks through the file server. It can mean uh, uh, severe uh, lawsuits or millions of dollars in financial, uh, financial projects not being uh, completed. To prevent any such disaster, Caltrans uses the software Virex from Microcom. As company policy, employees are asked to make backup copies of files and to avoid using shareware as much as possible. But Lou says that may not be enough. We can't hold everybody's hand and have them back up every single day or week or whatever the time frame is. Uh, we will, like I said, we, we do recommend it, but we cannot uh, actually go out to their computer and do the actual backup. Half the problem lies in the user not knowing the potential disaster an infection can cause. I don't think users are really aware of it until it actually affects them, uh, that the virus some affected their system and it shut them down completely. And then when that happens, it's, it's, it, may, it may be a little too late by then. The preventive measures that upper management uh, would need to be done to prevent uh, a virus in the future would probably be having an vi actual virus affect our system and having it shut down completely. While that may be the worst case scenario, the ultimate solution lies in educating the user and making him aware of the problem before disaster strikes. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Maria Gabriel.
of the most popular antiviral programs for the Macintosh are SAM and Disinfectant. And here to show us how they work are Lee Lensky of Symantec. Also with us, Alex Lau of BMUG, the Berkeley Mac Users Group. Paul? Alex, uh, BMUG runs uh, a bulletin board and uh, distributes shareware. A lot of people in the virus business say those are two things you should avoid. Is that good advice? Well, these... These places are probably the cleanest places you'll find shareware and freeware from. Uh, people who run BBSs and people who, uh, the national sources of shareware and freeware in the Macintosh market at least, uh, are surprisingly uh, the most clean and virus-free places you'll ever find software from. So it's a bum rap? I think so. Well, what is the b biggest risk for a typical Mac user of getting a virus in a system? The biggest risk is probably getting software from a friend, any kind, mm. shareware, freeware, whatever. Yeah. All right, uh, let's take a look at SAM now, Lee, and tell us what the sort of approach of SAM is as an antiviral program. Our design philosophy is one, to be passive, that is not get in the way of the user while thoroughly protecting the system, and two, to not get infected in the first place, which we believe is the most effective and cost efficient means mm -hmm. of dealing with viruses. Very simply, we have a memory resident component that loads every time the Macintosh is started that automatically scans floppy disks that are inserted and also prevents viruses from spreading through memory. I'll demonstrate that by inserting a floppy disk and the scan begins automatically and alerts the user that the disk is infected. Mm -hmm. Very simply, we can control this so that the user's only choice is to eject the infected disk and therefore we have no chance of spreading mm -hmm. the infection throughout mm -hmm. the system. We also have an on-disk application called the Virus Clinic. The Virus Clinic enables the user to do an in-depth scan of any hard disk or network device that's attached, including floppies as well, mm -hmm. make repairs to infected files. It also contains a very key feature, which is the ability to update the software itself should a new virus be discovered. One of the toughest parts of owning, or for that matter, producing antiviral software is to keep up with the release of new viruses. Mm -hmm. When you're on the user's end, you're always waiting for that diskette to right. be mailed by your software company. In this case, we have the ability to have our users call a telephone number 24 hours a day mm -hmm. at Symantec and hear information that enables them to fill out this screen and update their program themselves. In addition, registered owners of the software receive a postcard that contains the same information here that again enables them to update the program and their protection on the spot. I don't understand it. How do you do that? I mean, what can you tell me on the phone that's going to allow me to modify the program to attack a new virus? Very simply, we will give you the information that enables the software to search for the signature of that I virus see. in a file. Okay. Okay. And resource type is a Macintosh term. I see that's higher up in the description. There are text. What are the resources on a Macintosh? Every file is comprised of two portions, a resource fork and a data fork. The resource fork contains the executable program code where a virus could reside mm. and thereby launch itself and spread to other files so on the computer. So you're really looking for that key string which will identify that particular new virus and that's pretty easy to put in the program. That's right. We have two methods for identifying, one of which is to look for a specific kind of virus. We also have background uh, protection that protects against quote unquote suspicious activities mm -hmm. which could be an unknown virus that we have yet to define. Uh, trying to evade the operating system and if infect or do damage to the system. Yeah. One of the DOS problems is that some legitimate programs look like viruses. How does that work on the Macintosh? On the Macintosh, thanks to Apple's relatively strict guidelines for program development and for the fact that most of the operating system is protected in the ROM chip within the computer, attempts to bypass the operating system in normal use are very rare. As a result, when we see something like that, there's a fair bet that something deleterious is, is going on. Yeah. All right, Alex, as Lee says, one key strategy is don't get that bug in your system in the first place. Disinfect it lest you deal with it once you have discovered that. Uh, what approach do you take? How do you attack a virus and fix it up? Well, disinfectant works very similar to SAM in that it pr provides a, uh, an on-disk program. And it also provides an, uh, a memory resident program that loads every time the Macintosh starts up. Mm -hmm. And uh, it can be installed very easily just by selecting this. And then it allows you to restart the Macintosh to load, the, right. load it into memory. Mm -hmm. um, what it doesn't do uh, is scan every floppy disk for every known virus. It uh, catches a virus as it starts to spread. Uh -huh. So what we can do is 
we can start a program that I know is infected with a virus called anti. Okay. It's been deliberately infected in this case. Okay. Yeah. Well, it doesn't allow it to be infected. It beeps several right. times, and then it gives you an uh, it gives you a notice saying right. that you have to use disinfectant to remove the virus. So we click OK, and we start up disinfectant. And this was an attempt to use some resource <coughs> illegally or a piece of code that was recognized as virus code? Yeah, well, anti um, spreads, is one of the kinds of viruses that spreads as, it, as an infected program is launched. So it attempts to write pr some code to the system file. Uh -huh. um, so what we can do is we can just scan the whole disk, and several programs are infected on this disk. And then how would you go about disinfecting the, are you going to wait for it to come to the no, particular we can, one? We can, we can wait for it to come there, or we can just uh, click on disinfect, mm -hmm. and it would get rid of all the viruses on all the files on the disk. Mm -hmm. uh, there are several other things you can do, like uh, disinfect a, a particular file, a particular folder, um, or even, you can even set up the, uh, a, a certain computer as a scanning station. So you, you, whenever you insert a disk, It'll scan the floppy uh, and see if there are any problems with it. Is uh, now, now disinfectant is uh, shareware from BMUG? It's free. Um, it's BMUG is one of the people or one of the groups that uh, distribute it. Uh, it's written by a man named John Norstad at Northwestern University, and he puts out a uh, a free uh -huh. uh, upgrade whenever a new virus comes out. Mm -hmm. And, and getting back to Sam Lee, what, what does Sam sell for? Ninety-nine dollars. Uh huh. Now, that's only a Mac product you have right now. Do you, that's you, correct. You would all have anything on the PC side. Or? We have announced, in fact, the Norton Antivirus for the uh, PC, which features a very similar design philosophy to what you saw here in Sam today. Uh huh. And when's that due out? Very shortly. How? Last question. Just a little bit of time left. Uh, apart from using this kind of software, if you're if you're a Mac user now, are there what are the other sort of safe computing practices that one should be aware of to try to prevent this problem? Again, never trust an unknown floppy. Uh -huh. If you if it's not one of yours, then it's suspect. I would always hold to that. Yeah. Um, I would say check everything that you get from another another source, even if it is if it is from BMUG, mm -hmm. or <laughs> or from your friend who should be virus free. Yeah. Um, other than that, there's it's not really something to be overly paranoid about. Okay, good. Well, Lee of Symantec, thank you very much. And from the Berkeley Mac Users Group, thank you, Alex. That's our look at computer viruses. Stay tuned now for this week's computer news. In the random access file this week, if you were planning to buy an Apple printer for Christmas, you may want to hold off for a while. Two new low-cost Apple printers are expected to come out in the spring. These include a 360 DPI inkjet printer for less than $600 and a personal laser writer for under $1,500. The printers will be the first to use TrueType fonts and will include 13 different fonts. Well, while several software companies are porting Macintosh programs over to Windows, Ventura Software is bucking the trend by coming out with a new Mac version of Ventura Publisher. The Mac version offers several new features, including movable dialog boxes, undo and redo commands, and a spelling checker. Ventura Publisher is already available for DOS, Windows, and OS 2. Well, Steve Jobs is trying to move the Next computer into the PC mainstream. Next is expanding its networking and communications capabilities. The new generation of Next computers will support Novell Network clients and connect to the Macintosh via Apple Link. Well, taking a look at this week's top 10 PC titles, according to PC Connection, Microsoft's Entertainment Pack 1.0 for Windows is in the number one position. Coming in second is TurboTax 8.0 from Chipsoft, followed by Adobe Type Manager. Expanded Memory Manager is in fourth place, and Quicken is in at fifth. Rounding out the top 10 PC titles are PC Globe 4.0, WordPerfect 5.1, Flight Simulator 4.0, Windows 3.0, and PC USA 2.0. Well, prices continue to drop on 386SX notebook computers. Zeos International has announced a seven-pound machine for less than $2,300. It includes all the basics, built-in hard and floppy drives, and one megabyte of RAM. Well, the Laser Computer Company has introduced a new two-pound notebook-sized laptop priced at less than $300. The Laser laptop comes with a Z80 processor and only 32K of memory. 
It's also available in what Laser calls a Mac-compatible version, meaning it comes bundled with a Mac link installed. Well, as laptops become more popular, more services are becoming available for laptop users. InfoNet has unveiled a new notebook network for the person on the go. The system is based on InfoNet's global packet switching network and offers access in more than 115 countries. InfoNet offers electronic mail, online news, and fax service. Time now for Paul Schindler and this week's software review. Boy, when that active light comes on, you might just as well go out and have a cup of coffee. That is, unless you're using Super Laser Spool, load your print output into memory and get on with your work. Among other advantages, this is the only Macintosh print spooler that supports the desk writer. LaserQ is the DA you call up to control the print jobs. You can stop a job now or order the spooler to stop when the job is done. You can preview the print job, which is handy since the names rarely tell you anything useful. If you can't tell from the overview what's being printed, you can zoom in. There's extensive help online. You have a choice of how much buffer memory you wish to use. You can change the network priority if you're working with networked lasers. You can ask to be notified when your printing is complete. You can deinstall it without taking it out of your system folder. Handy for those rare occasions when you want to turn it off. Without this feature, you'd have to remove it from the system folder and reboot. Super Laser Spool 2.02 is $150 from 5th Generation Systems in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. Finally, it's time to think about making those New Year's resolutions. If aerobics is on your list, you may want to include a new program called Vision Aerobics. The software features a series of eye exercises to get those flabby eye muscles back in shape. You know, the ones you ruin by staring at computer software. Well, that's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. I'm Maria Gabriel. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by the Software Publishers Association, which reminds you it's a federal offense to copy software. The SBA provides information on how to stay software legal. Funding is also provided by PC Connection and Mac Connection, and by Byte Magazine and Bix. For a transcript of this week's Computer Chronicles, send $4 to PTV Publications, Post Office Box 701, Kent, Ohio, 44240. Please indicate program date.